In 1978, just as the Sex Pistols and The Clash were winding down and many people deemed punk as dead, a radical punk band by the name of Crass emerged and released the EP Feeding of the 5000. The band hoped to initially sell 100 copies, but the pressing plant they used would only print a minimum of 5,000, hence the title. Crass were astounded to sell all 5,000 independently and go to a second pressing. Quickly, the band gained a following so vast that they became leaders of their own splinter genre of punk, labelled anarcho-punk. Since, Feeding of the 5000 has hit gold status and Crass's legacy has gone on to influence numerous other bands as well as a number of protest movements. Despite Crass's success and significance in music history, their work and the anarcho-punk movement as a whole is often overlooked. A scholar wrote, Crass have been airbrushed out of punk histories. Today on Way Out Radio, we're going to shed light on Crass's impact on the UK punk scene of 1977 to 1984. Welcome to Way Out Radio, Episode 5, Crass Special, featuring an exclusive interview with band drummer and founder Penny Rambo. I'm just going to let it play. I mean, yeah, there's so much I could say, but the man really needs no introduction. Just listen to his wise words. I was blown away by this interview. I love it. Enjoy. Yeah, I know. This phone's absolute crap. So how did the song Big A, Little A come about? Oh, I mean, what was its source? Yeah. Um, you know, I really don't know. Um... um I mean, it's it's sort of very much within the sort of field that we always operated. Um, it, it was unusual in the sense that it had two very distinct sections. One which sort of, you know, was a critique of what was going on in the world, you know, particularly, you know, quoting each of the sort of the Prime Minister and the Queen and God and all the rest of it. Um, and, then it and then it went into a sort of, you know, like semi sort of slightly reggae style second half, you know, which was basically, you know, giving a few tips on what you might be able to do about it, like turning off the TV. Um, so it was unusual in that respect, you know, in the sense that it sort of had those two parts. And uh, I don't think there was anything, any sort of particular genesis, nothing particularly inspired it, you know, beyond the fact that, you know, we were... Um, uh, attempting to make people's lives better and anything I wrote was aimed at that basically. Okay. So um sorry I can't offer you anything more imaginative on that, but you know, I mean I um to some extent, you know, producing songs was you know, obviously um they were felt, um but uh, you know, it was almost tantamount to a job, you know, with the band, you know, keeping the stuff flowing, keeping, you know, like expressing the things we wanted to express. Um, you know, and I just, you know, seven years of songwriting, basically. Um, oh, and by, some of the... By that point, had you already been writing for seven years? No, I mean, I've been writing all my life, but I mean, you know, in terms of writing songs for the band, I mean, how long... You, uh, that was about two or three years in, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, it was 81. As far as I remember, yeah. Um... At that time, the other members of the band were increasingly not writing very much, mm. which is why I ended up, you know, I think writing something like 70%, 60, 70% of, you know, the lyrics for the band because the rest of the band seemed to dry up rather <laughs> as right. we sort of went on. Um, so, obviously, certainly for about three or four years in the band, I was certainly the you know, main songwriter, um, which... I meant I was at it a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what I thought was like really interesting about it because obviously punk is quite um, simple, sim like simple uh, musically because yeah. everyone was learning to play as they went. But yeah. like lyrically, it's very like cleverly put together um, in the way it's kind of presented like a theatre where yeah. Steve's taking on all these different characters and making a real yeah. mockery of them. Yeah, yeah, it's quite nice, but it's also framed by the reality of sort of uh, the kids what? in the playground, and then yeah. it comes back to, you know, be who you want to be. Yeah, it's yeah, quite nice. Yeah. So, did it take you long to write, or was it just complete? Well, I, I, um, it, I don't think it took particularly long to write. I mean, to sort of orchestrate it, work out how I wanted it to be. Um, you know, I mean, the arrangement 
um, is mine as well, largely. I um, mean, you know, I knew how I wanted my songs to sound. Uh, and that was sort of very much um, um, uh, enforced by, you know, years of doing um, sort of avant-garde theatre and electronics and all sorts of things. I mean, the the band was very informed by past experiences, um, you know, and I think in that sense, Crash were quite unusual in adding sort of, you know, a lot of different, if you like, genres into into what we were doing. I mean, I personally, you know, had spent, you know, most of my formative years listening to jazz and classical music, you yeah. know, with... I think that comes through in the sort of uh, the grooves that you choose on songs yeah. like... Um do they owe us a living? Sort of. Yeah. Sometimes you're hearing this really hard-hitting punk, gravelly sound, and then in the background mm. you go, and you're thinking, "Wow, yeah. like, I didn't even realise that's influenced by jazz." Um, yeah. Well, I mean, everything we did was sort of like, um, I mean, in a sense, of sort of like picking up on it, it being a sort of theatre, and I mean, it was. I mean, I regarded the entire band as theatre. If we went out, you know, when we went out. Um, playing it was a piece of theatre, which included a punk band. Um, but you know there'd be films and banners, and you know they were pretty massive events if we had you know, enough space to put them on. So, yeah. And you know the band was only very much a part of the whole show. You know it wasn't as most certainly in pop music and rock and roll. You know the band is the show. You know well we never saw it like that. You know I mean our, our attitude is very much no. This is a whole event. You know and mm-hmm. the people in the audience are pretty much a part of that event as we are being on the stage. So how do we make this work? Mm-hmm. And the incorporation of um, all sorts of influences. You know um, coming from me at least. You know was you know, based around my own love of, you know, much more expressive music than most pop or rock and rollers. Yeah. You know, I was interested in trying to create and succeeding most of the time atmospheres. So, you know, like in a song like um the Mar Inley song, you know, trying to create a menacing, frightening atmosphere into which, you know, the story of Mar Hindley could be written or or, you know, like in Rival Tribal Rebels, where, you know, which was sort of like a mild criticism, piss take of sort of skinhead culture, mm. you know, using sort of cocky, flamboyant sort of sounds, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we didn't, we certainly, you know, didn't follow the traditions of, you know, chorus verse, chorus of rock and roll. Mm. And also, you know, we, our, our music well, was uh, directed by me, at least, you know, the music was always towards trying to create atmospheres, trying to just as much tell the story in the sort of music as we were in the words. Uh, yeah, I think that's where a lot of bands go wrong when they start to believe that they are their character that they embrace on stage. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They become sort of very mono directional, and um, yeah, did I you mean, they come ever find sort of par- Sorry, go on. Sorry. Oh, I just finished that. I think, I think so many bands just become parodies of themselves very quickly. Yeah. For exactly reason you're saying yeah they do did you ever find it difficult when when you were sort of at um your peak did you find yourself start believing um the hype no no not at all i mean other people in the band might have done i certainly didn't no i mean it was really of no consequence or interest i mean we weren't in it for the same reasons that many bands are within that sort of genre. I mean, we were, I mean, I wasn't in the slightest bit interested in being, you know, a mm. rock star or and anything else. I just was interested in sharing ideas and that's, you know, been consistent throughout my life, you know. And it was the same before Crass. I mean, we had a big outfit called Exit, you know, and uh, we were much more radical than Crass were in many respects. And, you know, again, it was just the passing on of ideas. Anyone could join the band and anyone did. It was, a, you know, very free. It was very sort of 60s, early 70s thing. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, so uh, I neither believed nor disbelieved the hype. I mean, it was just, you know, a joke, really, to, to me. Yeah. That he had nothing to offer that was, you know, of any consequence. 
Okay. Um, well, I was just wondering, uh, like, what was it like? Because I know that you and Steve originally started the band. What did it feel yeah. like when uh, Punk first sort of came out? And did that um, did that give you an excitement that you wanted to be a part of? Uh, no, not that I wanted to be a part of. That was sort of suggesting. You know, no, I know I didn't. I mean, what it? Okay. So you mean that there was a sort of um, the, the sort of pistols and those people who sort of slightly preempted us. Mm. Um, yeah, I liked the music. I thought it was good rock and roll. And initially, I was slightly taken in by what was being said. You know, I thought, yeah, this is this sounds radical. This sounds like they mean it. I mean, I pretty soon realised, you know, that it was all very much within the framework of rock and roll. And actually, they didn't really mean it. But initially, I was, you know, yeah, pretty excited. I mean, possibly more excited by people like Patti Smith and yeah. uh, television, you know, some of the yeah. American art, art bands. Um, yeah. But, no, I mean, there's no question that people like the Pistols created a platform, you know, that which we made use of. Um, yeah. But, but um, and yes, I mean, I, 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 I was excited by some of the music i mean partly because you know i think the pistols you know for one were a very very good rock and roll band i mean politically they were crap but mm. uh in the sense that they didn't follow through and they didn't really mean it man but um okay. you know that's by the way really but you know to say they weren't in some way sort of you know an inspiration or a help in the direction of thinking, yeah, we can do this, but we can do it better. We can actually mean it and get on with it. We can turn this into something positive rather than something which is really rather destructive. Yeah, uh, I like what you were saying there about like Patti Smith and television and this sort of like art element to their music. Mm. And mm. one of the things I noticed a lot in Crass Records is that um, you have loads of different clips of different um, things, like you might have a news clip or static. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah and it's yeah, very yeah. much like a sound collage. Yeah, um, that's right, yeah. yeah. It feels like almost listening to a fanzine. Um, was that yeah, intentional? Yeah. Well, not that it sounded like a fanzine, <laughs> but, I mean, again, it was just part of our sort of bricolage, which I think is the usual term used for such stuff, you know, it's just... Anything goes. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, nowadays it could probably be regarded as sort of mildly postmodernistic. You know, we'd mm -hmm. you know use anything. You know, I mean, I'd just as much use a sort of riff from Benjamin Britten's War Requiem as I might, you know, something that, that Elvis had done. And um, and it was pretty much like that. You know, everything's up for grabs. Let's use it. You know, so um, and really, always the thing behind it: how can we make make this as powerful as we you know are able how do we do it how do we make this something which shouts in your face um you know and from the design side you know of the covers and everything to the production side you know we just you know we were throwing down the gauntlet really to ourselves and to anyone else who wanted to follow follow up i mean it was simply make the best use of, of, of this chance and let's go for it, really. Um, yeah. And, you know, the atmosphere was right at the time, you know. I mean, it might have happened anyway, but, um, I, you know, I think, you know, the social atmosphere, the political atmosphere was right for that sort of thing to happen, in much the same way as, you know, in the years of the Beatles, it was right for that to happen, yeah. except, except I think these are, you know, it isn't, the individual bands that create the circumstances. It's the sort of social atmospheres which demand, really, that someone stands up and does something, you know, and people seem to... There's always someone standing up and doing what the social requirement is, you know, and we happen to be that for a period. So would you say, even though um, you were influenced by like, avant-garde and jazz and other people yeah. in the band were influenced by music it wasn't yeah. the music of the time that inspired you it was more that inspiration was in the social and political context yeah i would definitely i mean um yeah most certainly yeah. i mean how can i use this situation i mean it's sort of like looking at oneself and saying well how can i use this situation to have as big great an effect you know towards a sort of positive world and a positive thinking, you know, as possible, you know, and that's so that's where we came in on that. I mean, I nowadays write aphorisms which are, you know, again, aimed at the same thing, to offer positive 
um, you know, a positive view on the world, you know, the same effort to try and make a better world, uh, which come over, you know, much more like Buddhism than punk. But, uh, you know, the, the, the intention is just the same. Um, the intention is let's all get together and, you know, shake this all up a bit. Um, mm. We don't have to accept the given rules. Yeah. You know, and crass. You know, definitely did that in the sense of their music. They, they, you know, basically said, "Well, we're, we're not accepting the given rules of punk, you know, which is three chords and smash, smash, smash." You know, we, we actually brought in all sorts of strange, you know, often worrisome elements. You know, from poets to jazz drums, or you know, as you say, the sort of collage of of uh, radio clips, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anything to broaden the front, really. Um, somebody said that you used pots and pans in the recording of Big A Little A. Is that Yeah, true? we did, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we were sort of... Um, as I remember it, I wanted to add... You know, we did that sort of, sort of semi-reggae rhythm. I mean, we, we obviously can't do reggae. It's a sort of... It's an art form in itself. But it's got rapping it was, as well. It meant, Quite impressive. Yeah, right? it was meant to just have that sort of aspect. And... Uh, you know, I remembered hearing reggae bands, which, you know, do use that, that, those sorts of sounds. I mean, it was with pre-computers. I mean, you know, like pre, uh, pre, uh, pre-digital. So you had to find things. and there were, uh, 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 actually, I think we still got the sauce, but I think it's our, our stainless steel sauce <laughs> in, uh, in the kitchen. But then I just thought, oh, no, that's the one. Because we'd use sauce with, with the band, I, you know, Exit, which was the band I had before. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we used to use any old junk. I mean, I used to... I didn't have a drum kit for a long time with it, so I just used to use an amplified bicycle wheel, which was great because we got all the different <laughs> boat sounds. I've heard about but this actually. How did that work? What the uh, the bike wheels? Yeah, how did you record? Well, it, it was just a bike wheel with a um, pickup mic attached to it. I'm not, I'm not sure that's exactly the right expression, but it's a mic. It's a little. It's a bit. It's a very similar mic to people cellists use or oh, violinists use. And that was just, you know, gaffer taped onto the rim. And then I used to tune up, you know, I used to tune up the spokes with, in the same way as, you know, you, when you tighten spokes on a wheel. Oh, so wow. I, that, I could sort of tune it. I mean, I never tuned it to anything formal, but, you know, I did used to sometimes tighten them up. But some, sometimes they got rattly. Or, and we did that with a lot of things. We just used to stick little pickup mics, pick I think they were called. And we just used to stick them on anything. I mean, if we turned up somewhere, there was a really nice iron railing, say, running off the stage, we'd use that as a drum kit for the night sort of thing. I mean, that was the <laughs> general sort of way of going about it. Oh, OK. Um, back to sort of the sound collages and things, what I liked, um, what I was interested in at the start of Big A, Little A, was um, obviously the children are chanting yeah. um, the original nursery rhyme. Is that... Yeah. Is that significant to you, or something from your childhood, or uh, something you felt people would latch on to? <coughs> I like the idea of innocence, you know, the innocence of the song being used in a sort of slightly sinister context. Um, I mean, obviously it was a game I used to play uh, when I was a kid. Um, I mean, the street games were much more common back then in the 50s. Or was that a game? Yeah. Huh? Was yeah, it? it was a game. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. Um, it was a bit like uh, tag or whatever. In fact, I couldn't for the life of you remember how to play it. But yeah, <laughs> it was part of the game. Uh, and um, yeah, so I mean, and also creating those sort of resonances. You know, the resonances of childhood. It was sort of reminding people of innocence, if you like, and yeah. and then ploughing in on all the things that have effectively you know, uh, limited or, you know, buried that innocence. I don't think we ever lose our innocence, but it gets buried in all the sort of considerations of adulthood and lost. Um, <clears throat> and it's a hard job to regain it. But uh, so it was sort of more about that. It was, I mean, all the, all the kids on it were living here. They were all the kids of the various parents within the band. And uh, it was nice to include them as well, because generally speaking, we'd all go off to the studio and the kids would go off to school or whatever else they were doing or hang around with someone who was looking after them here whilst we were all working. And it was really nice to incorporate all of them. I think we... I can't remember whether the girl... 
I think she wasn't there, but anyway, it was the um, you know the three young boys who were living here with you know their parents, mm. and you know who were part of the band. So, and that was a nice thing, because it meant they were part of something we were doing rather than just sort of seeing us wandering off to work every day. Okay, um, so that melody that th- that's used um, for that phrase in the song, um, is that the original, or did Crass make that one up? Uh, it's probably based around the old nursery rhyme, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't remember. I mean, as you know, I mean, nursery rhymes, they vary. I mean, you can have a street yeah. game to have a totally different tune in Rotherham to Newcastle. But, yeah, uh, yeah basically, the um, um, as, I mean, it was probably how I remembered, you know, playing that game when I was a kid. You know, I don't know. I really couldn't say. But, I mean, so it, it could very well be as it was or but yeah so that was the yeah very you know like um nursery rhyme really okay. yeah um yeah. so when you say um the sister might get you but it won't get me um, yeah what does the word system really encapsulate for you well system really we, i mean we used to use the term system i mean uh black culture uses man the man yeah um, it means, you know, those who like to think they have authority over our lives, you know, from bankers to vicars to parents to school teachers to just about every bugger who likes to think that they can tell you, me and all the rest of us how to live our lives. The system is everything but ourselves, almost. I mean, the system is what's out there. Um, and the first step of freeing oneself from it is realising that that's going on, that actually you don't have to listen, you can form your own views, you don't need to have a god with a beard, you can create your own gods, maybe you don't want one at all, whatever the choice is, you know, that's the exciting thing about being a human being. Yeah. You know, anything that inhibits that is part of the system, you know, uh, in my view. I mean, I can't remember what they call it in um, the cuckoo's nest, but it's a great expression. Uh, shit, I can't remember, but anyway... Uh, it's something. Film, but... Yeah, well, they use again, you know, for the system, meaning the mental institution, the politicians, everything that exists, which is controlling their lives, is given a sort of similar, you know, genetic term to cover the whole picture. You know, so that's what I meant. We meant, and I meant by the system. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like, I, I sort of obviously got it but then yeah, when, yeah, when yeah. you're writing about it you have to have no no a specific... sure it's good to have it yeah no that's right yeah, 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 um, yeah. that was a really good answer though. um good. this is something steve said actually when i asked him about the song he said that he remembers you running off in rehearsal to write these lyrics and you wrote them really quickly in about 20 minutes and you said to him that you could imagine a, a glaswegian punk singing them do you remember well i'm that? always <laughs> I don't remember that exactly <laughs> that. I mean, me yeah, Steve's got quite a memory. But I, um, what I do remember is, I mean, I did have a model Glaswegian punk in my mind throughout the seven years that we were on the road, rehearsing, writing in the studio, whatever we did, you know, whilst we were existing as crass, whilst I was yeah. crass, you know, my own personal identity was sort of put aside for that. Uh and I always kept in mind this idea of a young Glaswegian without really much, um, you know, finance, probably, you know, very undereducated, you know, victim of circumstances and birth. Um, and I always used to have that, that, that kid was a model for me, you know, and I would think, well, what would, what would you know, what would a young kid up in the, I mean, in those days, the Goebbels still, Gorbals, Gorbals, I would never have that. Gorbals, yeah, I mean, I don't terrible. Have, you know, terrible slum, slum um, housing, and that's where this kid lived, in my mind. And I just used to think, well, what would he think about this? You know, I mean, so it was like a meter, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd come from a you know, pretty comfortable and, um, you know, reasonably wealthy background. Um, and, you know, it's too easy for me to not really look at, you know, the, the re- sort of street realities. I mean, that was one of the great things of, you know, having Steve as a sort of work partner, you know, is that we could, you know, he, he brought the sort of wisdom of the street into my life, 
you know so that, um we get that so we could we could talk a very dual way i mean i've i've sort of i could talk about another sort of part of society and use that other part of society you know against itself actually largely but um you know using privileged education against privileged education which is you know what someone yeah. like probably george orwell would <laughs> you know claim to have done the same sort of thing yeah but, so yeah, I did. I had, I just had this model in my mind. Would you know? Would this Glaswegian punk be going on a holiday in Benidorm? No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't be able to afford it. He, exactly. So I said, well, I won't. So I was. He was sort of. He was sort of like a regulator for me, really. Um, am I getting a bit cocky? Yes, I am. You know, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a sort of very good way of just having a little idea in the back of my head to sort of keep me online, really. There's kind of like a target audience. No, it wasn't a target audience, you know, because the audience would vary massively. What he was was just one little individual who I didn't want to let down. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> you know, I didn't want him. I, You know, it was important to me not to let people down like that. I didn't want to do some shit thing that just because I hadn't thought about it clearly enough. Yeah. Okay. Whatever it was, going and buying a pair of boots I didn't need or, you know, all sorts of things in those days. We were very sort of, well, I, you know, hey, I think we all were, so very, you know, we very much limited our, um, our um, you know, personal lives, you know, to, to with this sort of concept of the whole. You know, if, we're, if, if one's going to start sort of talking about revolutionary hardships, then you've got to, you've got to live those revolutionary hardships. You can't be sort of preaching revolution from the swimming pool, you know. Mm. You've got to live it and be it, you know, and I think we did do that, and, you know, and I continue to do it in my own way. Yeah, definitely. So, um, were you all a part of uh, decorating the halls and, and making bags yeah, yeah, and things yeah, like that all yeah, the way yeah, through? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, what were the main things that you wanted to change, like, socially and politically? Did you want to bring people together? And I know there was sort of a fight against war and a fight against um and for animal rights and things like that yeah well everything really i mean you name it we everything which you know prevailed against human decency yeah really i mean you couldn't i wouldn't you know we weren't just specifically we were no more specifically pacifist than we were feminist no more specifically feminist than we were you know animal rights is yeah. or good foodists or whatever you know i mean it was whatever sees you through the night really i mean it was um no it was an all all out assault really on well uh, you know as, as far as an all out i mean i mean I, it was on everything you know, there wasn't any thing there was no nothing was left untouched really I mean, I hope, you know, it was an all-out attack on everything within what I described as the system, you know, earlier on. Yeah. It wasn't, we, you know, we weren't specific about it. OK. Um, so... I mean, we were specific on one thing, and that was, you know, the catchphrase, there is no authority but yourself. In other words, make up your own fucking mind, you know what I mean? Yeah. This is how we see it. Don't take this as gospel. Yeah. This is how we see it. You, you, and you know, and, and everything I think we did used to turn to that. Well, this is how we see it, but don't just take it for granted. You, you check it out yourself. You know, yeah. you be your own authority. Um, we weren't, you know, we really were aware of not wanting to preach. I mean, I know we come over as preaching on occasions, but that was always countered by some bit of humour, or it was countered by, you know, basically saying, well. You know, don't listen to us. Listen to yourself. You know. Yeah. Uh, and that, so that was the key, really, of anything. It was there is no authority to get yourself. In other words, make get your own life, make your own life. You know, and when, you know, it's not for us to be critical about where you take it. You make your own life. Yeah. Well, it obviously worked because Crass had a huge influence over a load yeah, of other did. bands afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Who well, man, and more importantly than the bands, really, I think it had a you know huge influence on our whole culture. You know, whether it was writing or you know, yeah. everything. I think, that, yeah, it did. It did work, <laughs> <laughs> and that's because within it, you know, there was a sort of 
for want of a better word, and I always use it rather guardedly, you know, sort of spiritual message, you know, that spiritual was, message was, you know, that there's goodness inside you, pursue it. Yeah. And it, didn't, it was never worded exactly like that, but I mean, the number of people who could see that and understood that that's actually what we were trying to say it was, you know, very, you know, warming. I'm very pleased that people were aware that that's what we were trying to do, you know, mm. to promote kinship, love, um, you know, all those rather old fashioned ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, ever keep an eye out now and hope that another band might come along that will make you feel... No, it doesn't worry me. I mean, other bands have come along, you know, and do come along. But, you know, I'm not, I've never confined it in any case to one genre. I mean, there's plenty of writers around, there's plenty of philosophers around, there's plenty of scientists around. I mean, if one wants... I mean, you could almost say that sort of quantum physics are the sort of new punk you know they really are i mean if you want exciting ideas go quantum i mean it's fucking crazy stuff you know <laughs> yeah. uh, so i've never limited myself to thinking or expecting you know there are people who sort of say oh well nothing's happening you know because all they're doing is you know watching mtv and yeah. checking out what you know x factors or something of course nothing's happening go and have a look and see what's happening in the scientific world you know these things come and go you know there's leaders you know, you know the, 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 it's all ultimately philosophy and sometimes the philosophy comes strongly from a rock band sometimes it comes strongly from a physicist sometimes it comes strongly from a healer so you know it, you never know where anything's going to come from you know so i don't look that way i don't you know and ultimately you know, if it isn't there, then that's your... That, that, why isn't it there? Because I'm not doing it. If I sort of think something's not there, I do it. Yeah. You know, it might not become a sort of, you know, next week's bestseller or anything. I don't care. It's not of no consequence. What's important is that's missing. I'll do it. Yeah. It's like bread. You know, you run out of bread. What do you do? You make some more. Yeah. Well, if you're running... If, if, if you think... Not you. If one thinks that, you know, we're lacking something in the world... Well, fucking do something about it, you know. Like that's that's what you do in your own home, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, you know, some you, the fire doesn't make itself. Well, neither no. does society. We make society. Well, why don't we take responsibility for that? So, you know, when you got quite a big response, well, like the probably the biggest response you could get by Parliament discussing crass, did yeah. that? Um, did you feel shocked, or did you expect it to come along? Well, I mean, it was. I mean, we knew that we were being, you know, we were under surveillance from MI5 and MI6 really? uh, throughout. And when it was, you know, patently obvious that we were, so you know, it was no real surprise. No, and, I mean, it was. No, uh, would I say it was reward? Yeah, I was pleased. I mean, I was pleased in the sense that, yeah, well, it's getting through. It means we were doing our job well. Mm. Um, so were they you know, spying on you or something? Huh? Were they like spying on you? How oh did yeah, you know? of course, yeah. Mm. Really? And our phones were tapped, our mail was opened. Probably, you know, one or two of the people who turned up to do fanzine interviews were actually undercover. I mm. mean, for so certain, they knew what we were up to, you know, and we were a threat. So great, you know. I mean, it's pleasing to me because you know their surveillance indicated to me that we were actually achieving our aims. I mean, if, if no one had taken any interest in me in politics, if no one had taken any interest in the secret services, then, you know, we wouldn't have been doing our job. If we were, we, we were a threat. Yeah. You know, we were talking revolution. Well, we, you expect to have MI5 snooping. And if you don't, then you've actually not really managed it. You're not doing the job. Mm-hmm. So when that all happened, you know, the feeling, you know, it's a mixed feeling. Because it's not very nice getting into all that deep shit, but you know, and it's dark and it's dangerous as well. But yeah. um, you know, it genuinely is physically dangerous. But um, on the other hand, there's the elation of saying, "Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, we're having an effect." You know, and it wasn't yeah. meaning, you know, we as a band, you know, we as a movement, you know, we can do it. You know, yeah, the kid in Glasgow is going to think, fucking hell, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's happening. Definitely. I thought we were meant to wait until someone told, we, told us we were allowed. It's happening. You can do it. And that's what we were trying to demonstrate. You can fucking do it. Mm. And we did demonstrate it. Yeah. yeah.
So with everything being like so in house and the whole movement, um, yeah. how were you distributing your um, your music? Were you going to the shops like physically, like? No, no, no. I mean, like by you know, very quickly we well, initially we were distributed by Rough Trade, um, and then actually we set up our own distribution outfit, which became you know the longest lasting um, independent distribution company uh, 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 besides uh, Rough Trade um, and still exists in a different form but the distribution company of Southern you know still exists and it was an, and you know in independent terms it's massive you know mm. no we uh, it, well, I mean it's exactly what we were saying you know if it isn't there make it you know so we you know we made a record label and then we found we hadn't really got the sort of distribution we wanted. Okay, what do you do? You make a distribution company, um, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and it, yeah, it turned into a sort of mini empire within alternative terms. And, you know, large lumps of it still exist today, you know, still operating. So with um, the single, like Na- uh, Nazasaki Nightmare, yeah. um, which had... Big A, Little A on the B side. Do you yeah. know? Do you know how like a ballpark figure for the distribution of that, or how many? You mean how we many sold? we sold? Yeah. Oh well, I know we sold something like twenty five. Oh no, twenty thousand. Wow. Hang on. We so I think we sold twenty thousand within the first week, which is why it went into the charts. I think it was in at about sixteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next week. UK charts. Yeah, and the next week he wasn't in at all, which meant we'd been bought out because we'd sold an awful lot more. Wow. And I know anyway, you know, 20, I mean, 20,000 is a lot of records to move in a week. So uh, would, we, would came, you... we came. Sorry, go on. So uh, um, were you removed from the charts or censored? Yeah, there's no question of it. You know, I mean, we weren't even in the top 100 the next week. Well, I mean, that's just not possible. Sorry. You know, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, because we'd sold more records. Once you get into the higher bits of the charts, you start, you know, it's incremental. It just starts growing. It's been, oh, sick, you know, that's in the charts. We buy that, you know, because that's how that sort of industry works. And, you know, there's no question that, um, you know, just as the big companies can buy themselves into the charts, so they can buy people like us out of the charts, you know. I've got no doubt about that. Yeah. Okay, um... I've just got two more questions. Okay. Um, one of them is about um, the song about the Roxy gig. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Band from Band Roxy. From the Ro- yeah. So um, what happened the night of the Roxy, Can if you can remember any of it? Uh, the, the re- what, what, when they turned us off? Yeah. Uh, well, we turned up. We were booked to play there and um, I can't remember the band who uh, this band called the Bears or something I think were the other band anyway uh, on that actually uh, that evening there was a load of P- Jim- Jimmy Percy followers turned up you know who were meant to be sort of you know righty skinheady types which were at all they were charming you know slightly roughneck but great you know I mean good good audience it was a fucking great audience and you know, we were all completely slaughtered. I mean, in those days we used to drink a lot when we were performing because we were shit scared, you know, and I know I was completely out of my head. Anyway, we started and it was, you know, it was going really well and, you know, the place was fucking heaving. I mean, it was actually packed and it was like a sort of, you know, huge amount of, um, you know, pogoing. I mean, it was like the sort of modern pits, really. You know, it was very very wild indeed and that was fairly new then i mean it was sort of like what was that 77 you know i mean that, that sort of stuff hadn't really started to become quite worn. i mean most of it, if you look at the sort of early um films of sort of the pistols for example there's not much going on in the audience people are sort of standing there jumping around a bit but they're not gone fucking wild it was you know and it was beginning to happen by 77. Anyway, um, they, the uh, people who ran the Roxy were actually were hoods, I think. You know, they just didn't like what we were doing, so they, you know, they didn't like seeing this happen. You know, the, you know, we were taking it over in a way, and so they came over and pulled the speakers in. I kept playing, blah blah blah. I mean, there's a very good um, article I wrote about it, which is in International Anthem. Uh, what yeah. the fuck was? 
Um, yeah, I don't know whether you read that, but that sort of covers the entire story, you know, rather well. Um, okay. Described. Um, I don't know whether you'd even be able to find a copy of International Anthem. Anyway, it was the internet. It was the first volume of the first, you know, edition, first whatever um, of International Anthem, which was well, you know, the newspaper that Julie did. Um, might be able to get one off of her, I don't know. Go up on Exit Stencil Press site. Have you have you ever been up on that? Yeah, okay, I'll have a yeah. look. Yeah, uh, I'll have a look and see whether there's, she might have some, I don't know. Okay. Anyway. So did everyone I make it home safe? Like... <laughs> what? Did everyone make it home safe? Yeah, I think so, I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we, when Eve and myself went down there about, a couple of weeks after, we were just you know, up in town, and we thought, "Oh, let's go down to Roxy." And you know, they 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 actually threw us out. Really? Yeah, we were sitting at the bar down there, and a guy came up and said, "I fucking know you, don't you?" And I said, "No, you don't know me, mate." And he said, "Yes, I fucking do." <laughs> you know, and um, so we were, you know, like thrown out. And I don't know whether it was my imagination. I don't think it was actually. I, um, you know, you see those films when people are walking down the street and a fucking car starts coming up behind them. Yeah. you know, to give them a runner. Well, that happened with us, and whether or not it was just some arsehole or whether it was anything to do with the people in the club, I don't know, but anyway, it did happen in Neal Street, where the place was. But, yeah, so, yeah, it was sort of all, yeah, it was a wild evening. Ah, ah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think that Crass have had, like, a real lasting influence um, on music and on the way people view things i mean obviously yeah. like from the hippie culture as well that went before it people yeah. have yeah. started to think more freely and yeah, yeah. other yeah. people haven't but um yeah. what would you say like is the legacy of crass uh, well i think i think almost just what you said really i mean that's uh legacy is that you can do it if you if you're willing to try yeah. Uh, but you know we each in our own way uh, you know have got value you know we only need to find how to use that value we each in our own way have got talent beauty all the things that you know are very human attributes and, and you know they're so sort of uh, masked over by the sort of culture we live in they're so suppressed in a way and Yet it's there, you know, the spark of joy, the spark of love. They're always deep in us, you know, and I think the legacy in Crass was, well, actually, you know, everything in the world is attitude. Change your fucking attitude. Don't You, you know, the first way of changing the world is to change your attitude to it. Yeah. Uh, and once you've done that, then you can start moving. But if you're going to sort of be a victim to the world, which is how, you know, we're taught to be, then you can't change it, you know, and, you know, and, and, you know, even if it's just a tiny little, you know, maybe your change in the world is going to be window boxes in your street. Great. You know? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If everyone's doing the thing they can do, the revolution's over. Yeah. You know, because that is the revolution. The revolution isn't men behind guns. The revolution is people saying, yeah, I can fucking do that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's how we that's how we reclaim the world. I mean, not just Britain; it's the world. That's how we reclaim the world with our feet, not with lots of sort of clever Marxist ideas. Yeah, definitely. I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know that you've done so much in your life outside of Crass, and mm. um, obviously everything is equally as important. But yeah. when I put on a Crass record, then it yeah. makes me feel like. I'm not on my own. Like I don't have to. Yeah. I don't have to take it lying down, and it, yeah, and it's just kind of like we'll have a go back at them, sort of uh, yeah. stand yeah. up for yeah. yourself. So I just, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say like thanks for that because it's helped That's me through so much. 